We're going to let you guys be seated for a few minutes, and um, we're just going to talk a little bit about Passover. Um, and I read the, the chapters on Passover, Exodus chapter 12 today. I'm going to read a little bit of that tonight. And you say, you know, that's Old, that's old Testament. What does that have to do with us in the New Testament? But you have to understand that every time God did something miraculous and spectacular like this in the Old Testament, it really was the picture of what Jesus was going to do, what Jesus was going to bring in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, when John saw Jesus approaching to get baptized, he said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And we know that that refers back to the Old Testament um, uh, um, religious process of sacrificing a lamb to cover the sin of the people, but we also understand that it points back to the fact that, as he read in First Corinthians five, that Jesus is our Passover lamb. So I want to take just a moment, and and we're going to read this, and then we're going to do something together, okay? Because as I prayed about it today, um, I'm going to I'm going to give you four words, okay? And you can write these words down, or you can just think about them. I, I believe that Passover is about liberation. We're going to go back and talk about these. Liberation. Time to be free in 2023. Somebody said that. That's right. Some famous person said that. That's right. Okay, so so liberation, revelation, which is speaking about the future. It's about preparation and about proclamation. Now, let me explain what I'm, what I'm talking about. Of course, we know that this was the time where after 435 years of Egyptian bondage, Israel was being set free. Okay. Now, God, I think it's fascinating when you go, go back and you read Genesis chapter 15, when God actually cut covenant with Abraham. Do you remember this? He said, look at the stars of the sky, look at the sand of the seashore, and that's how many your descendants are going to be. And then he, he begins to prophesy about his descendants, and then he causes a deep sleep to fall upon Abram, and God cuts covenant with Abram in a dream. You can go back and read it. I'm not going to read Genesis 15. But here's the amazing thing. God begins to prophesy to Abram about his descendants. And do you know in that prophecy, he says, there's going to come a time when your descendants will go into captivity for 400 years. That's not very good news when you're just cutting covenant. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) It's like, yes, I marry you and... And I commit that in 10 years, we're going to have major crisis and everything, but I really love you. And in 10 years, it's going to be really rotten and really miserable. Okay. That's not such a great covenant base, except God, <laughs> except God was sowing, showing them, I have a purpose. How many understand captivity is bad? Okay. It's bad. But How many also understand that God turns the curse to a blessing and that God takes the things the enemy means against us for evil and turns it for good? So who can tell me something good that came out of 400 years of Egyptian slavery? Go ahead. Tell me. Uh, I have have an infection in my ear, so I can't. Well, they did go into the promised land, two of them. They did. After that, they did go in. They possessed it. That's right. What, what was it about 400 years in captivity? Why would God like to go, oh, yeah, and by the way, you're going to have 400 years of captivity? Phil. That's right. They started as a family. They left as a nation. See, God wanted a people that were distinctive, that were different, that were united, that were um, unique from all the other nations. And he understood that if he just left them in a land, they would be like all the other nations of the land, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Termites, the whatever, whatever was there, okay? That they would be just like all the other nations of the land, right? 
they would they would partake of their culture they would but in slavery now they went into to Egypt they didn't go in as slaves but we know that the story was that another generation arose that didn't know Joseph didn't know the favor that was on his life and slowly over the first um, number of decades they slowly were enslaved and the slavery got worse and worse and worse and yet as horrible as that was what God did was he formed a distinctive nation that was different from every other nation that was on the earth yeah they were actually jealous they were jealous and fearful of the people they enslaved that which is why they enslaved them that's right this is not my good ear so if I ignore my husband you know it's not like I'm not trying to to listen to him that's my excuse sorry baby I didn't hear you okay uh So, but there came a point in time when God said, enough is enough. And this is what we celebrate at Passover, is that no matter what we've been through in our life, how many can now look back on your life before Christ and recognize the good things that God was doing in forming you? So it came up yesterday, we were on a School of the Prophets uh, Zoom call, and somebody said, they asked me this question. They said, they said, was it, is it, is it helpful to you that you were raised in a family that were not believers? They were more agnostic in their approach to God. How did that shape you in becoming who you are today? And I thought about it for a minute and I thought, you know what? Every time I felt like God was showing me something, Um, When I got saved, I had to make a defense of the gospel to my family, you know? And so was it good that I wasn't raised in Christ? No, I think that children should be raised to know Jesus from the time they're old enough to breathe, okay? Um, they They should be raised that way. But guess what? God did something with me because in me, he instilled this thing that, was so grateful for the presence of God, but also so willing to make a defense of the gospel because my parents are like, have you lost your mind? Okay, huh? It wasn't easy for me. And so you know what I did? I read every book I could. I studied the word. I mean, I literally read books on apologetics. You know, that's the defense of the gospel. I read books on apologetics just to be able to sit across the table from my dad when he would start firing questions at me. I'd be like, I'm armed and ready, okay? Ultimately, that's not what won him, but it did answer some questions in his mind. 